It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain. The people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you live on Supply Chain Now. Welcome back to the show. On this episode, we're continuing our Today in Manufacturing series in conjunction with the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance. Stay tuned for what I promise will be practical insights, observations, and some anecdotes. Uh, It'll certainly raise your manufacturing leadership IQ. Uh, We're very proud to say that our series is brought to you by HLB Gross Collins, a top 25 Atlanta CPA firm specializing in manufacturing distribution and supply chain operations. The firm has extensive insight in the industry and understands the specific needs these organizations face. So great to have HLB Gross Collins on board. One quick programming note, uh, you can find Supply Chain Now wherever you get your podcasts from, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, you name it. We'd love to have you subscribe so you don't miss a single thing. Okay, let's welcome in my fearless co-host for today's show. First up, Jason Moss, CEO of the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance. Jason, how you doing? Man, Scott, I'm doing great. Great to have you back. Yeah, I tell I mean, you, it's been a busy February thus has. far, huh? It has, yeah. Flu got me out last month, so I wasn't able to come play, but I am so happy to be back. <laughs> Lord, it's, it's, you know, the episode's not the same without you, Jason. Right. So. Well, you know, I know it's in good hands. I mean, between you and Laura, y'all just got this made. I, That's you know, right. I just, I just add a little bit of flavor to it. That so. is right. <laughs> uh, well, Jason, as you allude to, we also have Laura Matajewski, principal and leader of the manufacturing distribution and supply chain practice at HLB Gross College with us. Laura, how you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. Despite the rainy weather outside that just seems to never cease. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, and, and um, we had a little bit of rain last week. We had a lot more rain, it seems like, this week. Um, traffic slows down in Atlanta, which can be a good thing. <laughs> However, your trip time seemed to double. Uh, but, hey, you know, you take the good with the bad, right? Absolutely. Uh, just on cue, talking about traffic, <laughs> right? Um, okay, well, let's talk about, we're really excited to have our featured guest in the studio with us today, John Fluker, President and CEO at Grinzebach. Uh, John, how you doing? I'm doing great. A little bit wet, but uh, <laughs> coming in from the rain, but feeling fantastic. Well, you know, uh, I really wish I had been running the uh, the tape while we were having the pre the pre pre conversation. Yep. Uh, we kind of got a sense of uh, some of your stories already, and and we're gonna have to dive more into these here in just a minute. But uh, great to have you here, and I know you've been on a plane, uh, you know, with a, a leading the global organization that is Grenzebach. I bet it's good to be home a little bit on your end too. Yes, fantastic to be back. Mm-hmm. Fantastic to be here. All right, so uh, let's dive right in. We've got so much to cover that the, the hour is going to go by in a hurry. But, John, as we talked about kind of pre-show, first thing we want to do is give our audience the opportunity that we've been afforded, which is get to know John Fluker a little bit better. Mm-hmm. So tell us, first off, uh, where you're from, mm-hmm. uh, where did you get born and raised, and give us, you know, give us a skinny on your upbringing. Okay, great. So, uh, first of all, I appreciate the, the be here and the opportunity to be a part of this podcast. Uh, I am a Georgia boy, okay. uh, born and raised, uh, <laughs> born and raised in a little small town called Waycross, Georgia, about yep. four hours south of here, country. We always like to joke that we wrestle alligators down there, but that's not really true. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Go to the Okefenokee Swamp, and uh, that's how you prove your manhood. Uh, but <laughs> born and raised in South Georgia. And that's not far from the Florida line, right? Yes, yes. So you actually, uh, to get there, you fly to Jacksonville, mm. and then you drive about an hour uh, to get up to Waycross. So, okay. yeah, it's not that far from the Florida line. So you got a bunch of family in Waycross, I yes, believe. Yes, yes. So still tell there. us more. Yep, my, my father, uh, mother still 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 down there. My father was the was the mayor of Waycross at one point in time, so uh, the first uh, black elected mayor of Waycross, mm. so that's very proud of mm. him. And uh, family still still down in Waycross and still uh, still kicking, and we're just, you know we we love we love that part of, the, of Georgia. Mm. Well, and, and so your family is still actively involved, I believe, in the community. Lots yes. of businesses. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, they may re- they, they may rename the town uh, Flukerville. Maybe I don't know. No, I'm not quite <laughs> sure. I'm not quite so sure about that. But uh, <laughs> but uh, you, if you say the name Fluker, I think uh, everybody <laughs> do it a point you the right. So I tell you, if you go down there, if you ever get in the jam, just say I know John Fluker Senior. Okay. Not okay. John Fluker Jr. And then, uh, You're still establishing take, yourself down there, huh, John? <laughs> they'll take good care of you. 
Tell them you know my dad. They'll take good care of you. All right. So um, talk to us about what it was like to grow up in, in Waycross, mm-hmm. and especially, you know, now um, – and uh, my, my, I got some folks from South Georgia, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I always find it really interesting, especially in this global economy, is a compare and contrast, you know, that small town uh, upbringing with now an interna- you know, role in international business. Tell us yes. more about kind of what prepared you then. So, you know, it, we grew up in a time in Waycross. It was very, you know, interesting. Um, my parents were very involved. My mom was a school teacher, and then my, my dad, when I was growing up, was also on the board, but uh, there was an organization in Waycross that was very, uh, and let's say, it, with, the, with the strategy to prepare their children, which was me at the time, and some of my friends, for not just being in Waycross, but to expose us to a lot of different things. Mm. Uh, we were uh, in an organization called the Summer Institute, mm. and so with that Summer Institute, you know, they would take us to Washington, D.C., uh, we would uh, we were pages. Uh, we would come up to Atlanta. Uh, did a lot of travel. So they, my parents, very much encouraged me to broaden my horizon mm-hmm. and not just stay in the town mm-hmm. of Waycross itself. Not not to saying they didn't they didn't want me to eventually come back and live right, there and, right, right. And, and give back to the community, but they also wanted to broaden my horizon. So I love uh, that. With that, you know, it was it was very easy for me to 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 leave. But they actually encouraged that. They they didn't want me to go locally. Yeah. They wanted me to go away and, and and that's why i ended up going to school in boston a, <laughs> l- a little that. bit farther away than they probably anticipated <laughs> just but, a few uh, miles that's <laughs> all. just a few miles away you, you know that is, is so important as much as we love small town uh usa small town world what have you um you know being able to help kids open up uh doors of opportunity that they may not think about mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and before you know it it's what they're passionate about, right? Mm-hmm. And, yep. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of work going into schools, planting seeds. And, and you know, if, if the, just like the rest of us, if the kids, they don't know what they don't know. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I love how your folks very deliberately and intentionally, mm-hmm. uh, it, it sounds like to me, hey, if you want to be here in Way Cross, we love it. Yes. We, we, there's, there's business. There's opportunities for you. But – Let's help you explore. Yes, yeah, there's what a big old world out there. Out there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. And my, huge. my my father and my parents love the town of Waycross, so they're very much yeah. about uh, helping the town grow. And they've, they've right. you know been very much involved in that. But they also wanted <clears> to give me and my and my sister, you know, exposure and opportunities. So we both went away for college, and you know, mm-hmm. we eventually both came back to Georgia. And, mm-hmm. You know, and maybe mm-hmm. not back to Waycross itself, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I eventually made my way back home. Yeah, because Waycross, I mean, it's just, my wife is from Waycross, and we talked about that a little yeah. bit before the show, and it's really exciting because I don't, you know, I don't get to meet a ton of folks yeah. that, you know, yeah. that, that's from there. I mean, I was I grew up kind of in Henry County, uh, just south of the uh, south of Atlanta, but, um, you know, we get to go down and spend quite a bit of time on mm-hmm. Waycross, and mm-hmm. we try to as much as we can. And down there, I mean, the industry, it's either you're in your pulp and paper yes. or you're working for the railroad. Yep, exactly. That's, that's like the only two that's, things that's that there things is in Waycross. Yes. If you're not working, for, well, there used to be well, a cigar factory down there. But, well, then, then I think recently um, um, they've also, the medical industry has grown quite a bit mm-hmm. down in the town of yes, Waycross. It's correct. become the, yeah. uh, uh, area for like the southeast Georgia. Right. So they really, like my old elementary school is now a, a nursing home or something like that. Yeah. Now. So it's, yeah. that part of the industry has grown quite a <laughs> bit. So uh, Waycross has definitely grown quite a bit. Right. So we're making a Waycross commercial right here. <laughs> yes. Chamber is going to be very happy. Yes. Hey, so, man, hey, man, I married me a swamp girl, and it is a good thing. Now, she gets kind of upset when I say that, yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. I don't know why. I, don't know why. I, don't, I have no idea. Um, all right, so, John, you've mentioned a, a couple times school uh, yes. up in northeast yes. uh, Boston. Uh, yes. Tell us about that. Ex- what drew you there, yes. and what did you major in up there? So uh, I went to school at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, That's highfalutin, <laughs> by the way, John. <laughs> yeah. Highfalutin, right, exactly. <laughs> so MIT, um, MIT grad. Um, I, w- I was always wanted to be an engineer, right? At first it was aeronautical engineer because I had a dream that I wanted to go in space and and, and, um, and be work for NASA, you mm-hmm. know, and things yeah. of that nature. I think we went to uh, Huntsville, Alabama at one point in time, went up to some institute, so yeah. that kind of piqued triggered my interest, that, triggered yeah. that for, yeah. for engineering. But then – you know, when I got to MIT, uh, I decided that, okay, maybe I wanted to have a more of a, a baseline of an engineering degree, so not being aeronautical at that time, but to step back and, mm-hmm. and uh, become a mechanical engineer. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's what I studied in. That's what uh, um, I graduated from, and my, my, engin- my background is engineering. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, I've done that quite a bit in my life, and I think it's also helped me in my role at, uh, at, uh, at Grinzebach as I well. I bet. Yes. Um, all right, so so you graduated from one of the finest 
engineering schools yes. in the land. Yes. Um, what was your first job? My first job coming out of MIT was for a company called Teradyne. Mm -hmm. uh, Teradyne at that point in time was heavy in the semiconductor industry, test equipment. Uh, I was a manufacturing engineer, actually, my first job coming out of uh, college. And that, my major responsibilities at that time was to look at the designs of our equipment and understand uh, how it was designed and to make sure that it is designed the best way to, for the ease of manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So I worked a lot on the floor. Uh, I spent a lot of time on the manufacturing floor building the equipment that uh, was designed. And it gives you a different, in, you know, a different mm -hmm. perspective. Right? Yes. Because uh, when you have to reach your hand around this corner to get to the screw that's hard to get to manufacturing, you'd be like, okay, that's not the right way to do this. We have to, we have to design this in such a way that for ease of manufacturing. Love so it. that was my, my first job. And I think that was very impactful t for me. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, right, you know, as, you know, we can come up with the best design possible, but if nobody can build it, Right. And nobody can build it efficiently. Or fix it. Efficiently yeah. or fix it. Yeah. Right. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> right. And so my second job after that was, now you talk about fix it, was we called it product support engineering. Right. And uh -huh. so from there, you know, I had to support the products in the field. Uh, right. right. Yeah. And also support my engineering, the engineering staff in the field. Right. So when there was a problem, you know, I always joked that I had a I always had my bag packed. Right. Because mm -hmm. I could come to the office and my boss would be like, hey, by the way, we have a ticket for you to go to Taiwan. Mm. <laughs> hmm. And uh, okay. you said, OK, well, I'm going to the airport and <laughs> headed to Taiwan and uh, flew to Taiwan, you know, 24 hours to get there. 12 hours on the ground to fix the problem and 24 hours home. So, you know, <laughs> more time. And so that gave you a different perspective. It's like, okay, well, if I'm going to have to fly all the way to Taiwan and all these places around the world, I want to make mm -hmm. sure I want to fix the problem before mm -hmm. it gets there. Yeah. Right? So that gives you another different that perspective. Proper motivation. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> exactly. so John, I want to go back just a, uh, a minute. When you mentioned uh, your first role with Teradyne and you mentioned kind of being on the, on the factory floor yes. and, and some of the um, impact it had on you. Talk to us about the people. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I think a lot of folks, um, a lot of folks that maybe haven't ever been in a plant, yes. uh, maybe make certain assumptions about what manufacturing is like, mm -hmm. the people, or maybe, unfortunately, sometimes the people are completely an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what that those, those early experiences for you. You know, uh, the people were are, are amazing, right? Even though you know, I was working on the shop floor with these guys, and here I am, this MIT graduate, right? It has a certain, you know. People have a certain perception, yeah. right? You know, when, yeah. so when you get up in there and you're willing to to build something with the guys, they they have a different, you know, they give a different perspective for you mm -hmm. as well, right? Yeah. And so I I, sh I learned so much from those guys uh, working on the shop floor, mm -hmm. right? You know, building the equipment, uh, understanding, you know, from their perspective, say, hey guys, you know, these engineers are fantastic. They come up with these great designs, but if you did it this way, mm -hmm. if you did it that way, that could we could speed up the manufacturing process and ultimately mm -hmm. you gain a certain perspective for that these these guys can give you a certain perspective of how to help the company make money mm. right mm. they can help you give direct mm -hmm. feedback and if you listen to what they're saying mm -hmm. and you bring it back to the organization right then you be that i felt it was my job to be that translator right uh -huh. mm -hmm. that translator from the manufacturing floor to the engineering because i could speak both languages yeah. and um, i could help you know give their feedback to the organization to be more efficient to ultimately what, what, what the company wants to make money, right? And so that's the that's the goal. Love it. Yeah, I love it. Um, okay, so fast forward, mm -hmm. um, and and we don't necessarily. You know, if, was there one more role beyond the Teradon and then beyond uh, the second company that like to send you to surprise you with a trip to Thailand or? No, no, uh, that was all Teradon. All Teradon. That was all okay. Teradon. So it was just a different role. Just that a different product. role. Uh, okay. Yes. yes. Um, so what was the role? Do you feel really teed you up? For now serving as president, president. CEO, you know it's I, it's not one role for me. It was mm -hmm. the, all the different roles that I played a part in my perspective, right? That uh, helped me um, um, prepare me for the role I'm in today. So when I when I left Teradyne, mm -hmm. I, I went into sales, right? And so then it was I had some I had some let's say uh, customer perspective when I was at Teradyne and my role as product support because I would have to go to the customer site and get their feedback about what they saw but you know being a sales right and, have, and then having to go to a customer and understand their needs mm. and what 
they want to accomplish with your equipment, mm-hmm. right, gave me a different perspective, right? So now I had the perspective from the shop floor, I had the perspective, resp- uh, the perspective from the, uh, the guys servicing equipment in the field, and now you get the, the better perspective of what the customer. What the customer really yeah, wants. Yeah, what the customer yeah. really wants, right? <laughs> you know, you think you know what the customer wants, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I got you that. Know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then uh, you, you really, when you really start talking to them, you was like, okay, well, that's not what I thought you wanted, or that's not what, when I was designing this piece of equipment in the in my house, and I think this is great, right, but then at the same time, the customer doesn't need it, right, then you're not going to sell it. Right? Correct, correct. So that, so I think it was those three roles together helped prepare me uh, for where I am today, and then, mm. then moving up in the sales rank, so within Grinzebach, I came to where I am through the sales department. Mm. Mm-hmm. So sales guy, director of sales, then VP of sales, then CSO, um, and now uh, president and CEO of Grinzebach Corporation. So before we talk about what Grinzebach does, how um, how challenging was it, especially giving, uh, uh, not taking anything away from engineers because they can do mm-hmm. anything they yes. you know, anything in the world, but you know, for in, I've always been curious about the transition of engineers into sales centric roles. Yes. Tell us about that. That is, you know, it is very challenging. And, um, and you know, I, I'm an engineer, right? And, yeah, you know, I yeah. always, my, my engineers will tell you I used to be an engineer. I may, maybe I'm not anymore. But <laughs> I, I, you know, I think you, you have to have the right mentality from an engineering perspective to understand that that what you are creating, you know, you have to be able to receive feedback, mm-hmm. right? And so not, not all engineers are, are good at receiving <laughs> feedback about what they're designing, yeah. right? And listening. And listening to the customer, listening. right? You yeah. know, because it's very easy, you know, to, you know, you get you creative, right? You know, you have your baby, right? I created this, right. right? And I love the way, I think this is the best machine in the world, <laughs> right? And this is what I think it should do, and it should have these features and that have these features. But if the customer doesn't want those features, or better yet, doesn't want to pay for those mm. features, Correct, right? yeah. then you have, to, you have to, as an engineer, you have to be able to swallow your pride a little bit. Okay, I need to design this for the customer. Mm. Right? Yeah. And that's the, that's the biggest challenge moving from engineering into sales is, yeah. to, is to having that, that, you know, mm-hmm. that not being too b- prideful mm. to be Correct. able to uh, understand it. I, ultimately, whatever I'm doing, this coffee cup, for example, mm-hmm. if the handle is not right, then I'm not going to use this coffee cup. I'm going to get another one, right? Correct, right? yeah. And so there's uh, there's always options in the marketplace for your customers. Yes. Yeah. And so yeah. it's especially now. Especially now. <laughs> wow. um, okay, so, so I appreciate you sharing. Uh, yes. That was an unexpected question. I appreciate you sharing. <laughs> um so let's talk about what Grenzebach does. Tell us about the company and, yes. and what the company does. So we are a, a global organization, um, 1,500 people globally, uh, headquarters out of Germany. So I'm, my responsibility is for the North American market. Uh, but glo- So we, we focus on a multiple different industries. Uh, we call it the glass industry. Mm-hmm. So the, what I always say is that nobody realizes how much technology goes into making glass. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, mm-hmm. It's a lot of technology. That goes into making glass. So we are, you know, from the material handling and, and also some part of the process steps of making float glass. Uh, that's mm-hmm. one of our major markets. The second major market is our, what we call the building materials uh, market. That's your gypsum wall boards. That's your uh, ceiling tiles. Um, Hardy board. Hardy plank uh, mm-hmm. is, is one of the, the one of my biggest customers, James Hardy. Um, and our third, let's say vertical, is intra logistics. Mm-hmm. And so here we have our fleet of mobile robots, so AGVs. Uh, software platforms. Uh, yeah. So those are our three major verticals that Grinzebach is uh, is playing playing in. So on that third, are you deploying those uh, those that, that technology into other customers' facilities? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. So Learn warehouse warehouse yeah. automation. Yes. Oh yeah, so it's really cool. I yes. came I came to the automation fest. Yes. And man, yes. these guys put on a show. Yep. Mm. If you ever, if you have the opportunity, <laughs> uh-huh. you can get in there. I don't know if I don't know if that's opened up, but yep. they, they, they put on a pretty, yep. put on a pretty yep. amazing we, event. Yeah, we have it. Uh, we have it every two years. Uh, we host it. We have we have it during the September October frame. We call it the uh, Automation Fest okay. off of October yeah. Fest. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So you know, we it really is a, a a whole day that we dedicate to educational uh, to our customers. So we have okay. some of our key sub suppliers coming in to give seminars, uh, mm-hmm. but then we have our own seminars and demonstration of our technology. And then at the end of the day, you know, I put on my leader hose and I grab my beer. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if, you have, if you like haven't seen real, me in leader hose, yeah. that is a sight to see. <laughs> yeah, I will buy a ticket to that. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that was great. That was great. I appreciate you uh, talking about that. It was uh, it yeah. was fun. It was a fun event. It was a fun mm-hmm. event. Um, now, 
we get this a, di- a lot of different answers to this next question because you know CEO the CEO role just because the title are, are the, is the same. Mm-hmm. Gosh, we see CEOs spending their time in a wide variety of places. Where do you spend your time, and what's your favorite aspect of being in, in the the leadership suite? Wow, that's a that's a that's a great question. So I I. I I'm still at heart a sales guy, mm. right? And so I want to be in front of customers, not too much, right? I like mm-hmm. to let my sales team be the front, uh, but uh, I still have a great relationship with a lot of customers here in North America mm-hmm. uh, market. So I, I spend a lot of time still, um, well, when I'm not on Delta, <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> right, flying flying to around the, to visit my customers around the country. Uh, yeah. But so that's still, you know, where I spend a, a good portion of my time. Mm-hmm. Um, ma- maintaining those relationships with our key customers mm-hmm. and our customers that we're trying to grow mm-hmm. um, for the market. But, you know, uh, I'm, I am spending more and more of my time in our manufacturing facilities, you know, supporting the, the team as well, mm-hmm. you know, guiding them to where we believe the uh, organization needs to be um, in the sure. next three years, mm-hmm. how we're transitioning a little bit from where we are today to the future. Mm-hmm. So I spend a good amount of my time there. So I think it's pretty much split right now, maybe 50-50 between customers and uh, internal discussion. So. Mm-hmm. And Scott, you asked a great question a minute ago about what was your transition from engineering to sales. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to toss one out to you. Is what was your transition from engineering to the leadership roles that you yes. have now i mean because that's a that's a different game it right? is it so, is a very so different what was, game, what was right? the it's, what was the things yeah. that it, the people are, are are now in that space that yes. are about to make that transition and, what and what guidance would you give and them? i'm still learning right i think it's right. you know <laughs> i you know it's you know when you come into the office every day or you you visit something every day you use a different learning experience right, right? I, yeah. I think it's you know uh, transitioning I, one of the good things about being an engineer um, and having that engineering background um, and coming out of MIT uh, as that background is that uh, it we really you know t- t- think about how to solve a problem. Okay. Right? Yep. Yep. I got you. So you know the biggest difference between moving from an engineer into an executive is not so much for me trying to solve every problem, mm-hmm. right? To try to get into the weeds, right? Because I can I can go Pretty down quick. to the nuts and bolts <laughs> uh, very yeah. easily. Yeah. But uh, but the transition from the problem solving into the vision, uh-huh. right? And so setting the vision for the organization and where we want the organization to be in three to five years and trusting the team Mm -hmm. to solve the myriad of problems to be able to get to that vision Mm -hmm. and guiding the team, not so much trying to solve the problems for the team, but the guiding the team to, okay, okay, if we hit a roadblock here, okay, we we, maybe we have to try a different thing, but ultimately setting that vision, Mm -hmm. right? And so I think that's the biggest challenge for moving from engineering to leadership is moving from the problem-solving role to the to the leadership, let's say visionary role. Right. That's that's the biggest. So, what are you reading challenge. right now? I mean, what's who are some of your favorite authors or mentors or what books are you reading? I'm always, yeah. Yeah. always I mean, I'm always looking, man. I'm yep. always hungry yep. to figure yep. out. Well, that's what, a that's what, a trick question yeah. right there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I you know, well, you know, uh, so there's the um, um, the spiritual part, right? I, mm-hmm. I'm very much involved with my church, so I, there's a lot of things that I'm that I'm doing from that perspective mm-hmm. of learning of you know my whole spiritual portion mm-hmm. of it, right? Yeah. Um, this Bible app that I use every day to try to different uh, different nice. things uh, yeah. to read on, you know, give me different life lessons. Uh-huh. Uh, to it. then I, I go down to my my just to kick back. Uh, I love uh, uh, Brown, mm. um, all the things that he's done mm-hmm. with uh, with uh, what's the book's name? The um, with uh, oh, Stan Brown mm-hmm. oh. is one of my one of my biggest that I like to read right, right. now. So those are the kind of things that I like to read. Mm-hmm. Plus, you know, you have your yeah. your help books and your you know seven <laughs> you know habits of right. you know. I think I did some seminars, some AMA seminars recently that helped me that guide me in that direction too. So there's a lot of different things like that as well. Yeah, there's one we're working on organizationally, yep. and it's uh, Mike McCallowitz. Okay, and he he's written a book. He actually read, uh, wrote a book. Profit first. I read that yep. last year. Yep. Made a huge difference okay. in my business and financially where we're at as an organization because mm-hmm. just the structure of it. Because I'm, mm-hmm. I do like structure and, and, and yes. figuring out challenges and problems. But he's also written another book called Clockwork. Okay, and it's about um, putting systems in place mm-hmm. internally so that you can do exactly what you're yes. talking about. It's like all the pieces and mm-hmm. and and putting the pieces and the systems in place so that your team mm-hmm. can solve the problems yes. and take you out of the yes. You yeah. know, unless something like catches on fire, you want to move to you want to get more right. to that quadrant one zone, right? Yeah, exactly. yeah. get back yeah. to the visionary. Yeah. Get back get to back what to you're challenged right. to do. Yes. So I'm going to surprise. So so 
as we're asking people our favorite reads, and you know, don't say author, but Laura, what what have you found to be a really helpful read here lately for business leaders? So interestingly, you know, I think that the challenge that I face a lot is, especially with a lot of new faces that come in, and as you're trying to develop people to that next level, because that's the way we do it. Mm-hmm. Is really you've got to develop them internally to grow. Mm-hmm. Um, so from that perspective, there was a book called um, The Art of Constructive Criticism. Mm-hmm. So how to engage them to point out the areas that, you know, are a challenge for them, but not it's I'm going to be beating you down mm-hmm. here so they go in the corner and you are just you just feel horrible. <laughs> it doesn't but start with you're a dummy. No, step one. No, but it's about understanding their strengths mm-hmm. and how to uh, develop those to offset the weaknesses, yes. get them engaged. And, yes, yeah, it's kind of that whole mama bird pushing the baby bird yes. out of the nest thing, which I, I, you know, I don't like pushing people mm-hmm. in that direction, actually, literally out of the nest. But I want to engage them Mm -hmm. and i feel like that has been really helpful to me from the leadership perspective Mm -hmm. that's a good that's a good point but i think you know one thing that i'm that we are always trying to learn how to do is right what are the organizational needs right Mm -hmm. versus what what skill sets do my people have right and then uh, making sure those match as much as possible and then you know how do we want to grow the people to to be able to support the organizational needs as well so that's always Mm -hmm. that's always interesting dynamic and challenge right Mm -hmm. you know what 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 is the structure of the organization Mm -hmm. and do the people i have fit the structure and okay what trainings or what uh, skill sets do we need to give these right. get yeah. the people to have to be able to do the best for the organization right. hey laura well. check this yeah. out hey scott i'm gonna throw this over to you <laughs> what books are you reading right now what's your what's, what's some of your favorite authors what's what's going well, on in your space so i'll tell you all some sites that okay. i rely on especially almost day in and day out mm-hmm. uh, for me uh fast company I really mm-hmm. like okay. the, the, it from leadership to technology to workforce, you name it, mm-hmm. a lot of cool stuff there. Supply Chain Dive, I think, is one of the mm-hmm. best supply mm-hmm. chain uh, uh, news sites uh, available. Um, and then I should say, you know, so Supply Chain Digest has been around for a while, and they yeah. just revamped their website. Okay. And really it makes it easier and, and more appealing to navigate through and find different news and developments and interviews. So mm-hmm. those are three that are on my go-to list, Okay, mm-hmm. especially if you like supply chain. And, and, and Fast Company is kind of a, um, as it, as it the name suggests, it's kind of a, the cutting edge side, right? Yeah. It's really look forward, it's very forward looking. And uh, and also they're, they're a very big, propo- it seems like to me, a proponent of, Top three, this top five, this, mm. and I'm I'm a I'm a list freak, right. so I, I love my lists. <laughs> you get your snippets, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean that's just that's how I process information. Good. Right. So all right, so now we've got the curveball question. Yes. Everyone's had a, had a sta- uh, take at that. So let's let's kind of keep going down this path. Uh, we've clearly we've touched a lot on leadership, a lot on workforce, a lot on on uh, career transitioning, mm-hmm. a lot of what you've spoken to. Um, let's you know as as, as we broaden the scope of the conversation out and we think of that global manufacturing industry uh, that, that you're smack dab in the middle in. Yes. What one or two issues or trends or developments, what's, what's on your radar more than others right now? Digitalization, right? Hmm. That's, that is the, the big thing that we are focusing on as a company, right? You know, we, we always joke that the, you know, we we're German made, right? That's, that's our, that's our mantra. I, I always tell this this funny story. Uh, it, was, it, was no, it wasn't funny during the time, but I was at a plant. And, um, Those are the best ones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was at a manufacturing facility one time, right? And uh, we were in the meeting, and then all of a sudden the doors popped open because a tornado hit the building. And oh, it yeah. sucked the paper off of the table. So the horn went off, and we all started running. And where did we run? We ran to the Grinzebach equipment because I knew if, if I hung onto the Grinzebach equipment, I'd be safe. Wow. Right? What a <laughs> testimony. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, that's a kind of a funny story. Right? Uh, maybe, a little, maybe a little bit exaggerated, right, but right. not that much. Right. <laughs> but, it, it, but we are, you know, at our core, we are a manufacturing company mm-hmm. with, that makes high-quality equipment that lasts for, you know, float lines. They run seven days a week. 365 days a year for 20 years in a row, right? right? So our equipment has to last, right? And so, you know, that's that's kind of in our DNA. But now we need to be more in digitization, right? And what, yeah. the, what does that mean, right? What is IOT and how does that fit from our customer base? And how can we, you know, move and, and support our customers in this mm-hmm. realm? How can we use data anal- analytics uh, to help our customers eventually be more efficient and profitable. So not it's not just selling our strong German-made mm-hmm. equipment, mm-hmm. but it's also how can we help our customers 
business, right? And so that's where we're transitioning to as a as an organization. On the data side, um, John, I'm curious. I think there's been such a shift in the industry in general for implementation. Yes. Everybody wants the cool things yes. like robots on the floors yes. and things like yes. that. Um, and they give so much information mm-hmm. to the plant managers, to the businesses. Um, what are you seeing from like a you know challenges or successes standpoint there with gathering that data and disseminating it? I think that's that's you, you spoke on it very clearly. Gathering the data and disseminating, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. You know, so you know what is the platform to do that, right? Yeah. And so Grinzebuck actually developed our own platform um, that fits very neatly into the space because you you know and we have these you know these larger versions, but maybe they're too big or too expensive or they don't quite fit for manufacturing. So Grinzebuck, uh, we developed our own platform that can be used by like you know manufacturing companies because we are a manufacturing company we know what they we know we believe we know what you know what data points you need right you know what data points are good right right? so we want to have that you know we want to develop a platform that our customers can use to gather this information Mm -hmm. and actually write their own applications as well right um so we have a we have a platform called seracy Mm -hmm. um don't ask me what it means i forget where it comes from Mm -hmm. but (laughs) our seracy platform really is this is this this, uh this this architecture Mm -hmm. to gather data uh and we have our own applications that we've written for the specific industries that we're in but we also it is a platform that allows our customers to write their own applications Mm -hmm. as well so you know, bringing that to our customers and uh, and showing them what it can do and how we can gather data, not only from the Grinzebuck equipment, but from whatever machines or equipment or process steps that they have on the manufacturing floor so they can gather that information mm-hmm. and really use it for, for business. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I was so impressed with at the automation fair was the depth of your supplier yes. and your partner base. Yes. I mean, because there's one thing, I mean, you're great at doing what you do, but if you align yourself with good partners, yes. you know, I mean, key people that can provide the resources and the knowledge in an area that your customers need, mm-hmm. but you don't need to um, get off your, you know, QBR, your, you know, your focused yes. role, uh, man, you know, that, that's a real, that speaks volumes. Yeah. I, I, I strongly believe in a strong partnership, right? I mean, yeah. it, Nobody can be the expert at everything. Bingo. Right? Yep. You know, I, I know I'm not the expert at everything. <laughs> right? And if uh, my wife can clearly tell you I'm not the expert at everything. <laughs> but, you know, but having a strong partner network and, yes. what, and, and looking at what they can bring to the table and not being afraid to bring them in front of your customers. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, that's very important, right, because your partner network can enhance your overall offerings and can bring things to your customers that you can't bring and if you do it well, all right, then you can overall bring a strong solution yeah. to your to your customer base. Win, win, win. Yes. Yeah, it's exactly. about community. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's, exactly. the, yeah. that's magic. Okay, so uh, digitization. I, would t- I, I can have <laughs> 17 cups of coffee, and I still miss that word. Yes. Um, that's front and center, uh, especially for manufacturing, especially for supply chain. You know, all the rage in, in, in supply chain, which some people are saying is dying uh, in the name of the circular economy, right? Mm-hmm. Uh Round and round and round we go. Visibility is so mm-hmm. important, right? And, 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 of course, visibility is a, is a first or second cousin to uh, digitization. Um, what else, when you think about, um, you know, global, the global manufacturing world, mm-hmm. what else is on your radar? You know, not to get too much into politics, yeah. and um, I don't, I don't want to dive in that, but just the uncertainty, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's mm-hmm. a big thing. Um, for us as a global manufacturing company because right. we have manufacturing in North America, we have manufacturing in Europe, we have manufacturing in China. Um, and, you know, I, we pray every day for all the things that's going on with the coronavirus right. over there. And uh, yeah. uh, so keep all those guys in your prayers. Uh, but just understanding, you know, how, what are the changes coming from the global community mm-hmm. and how does that impact, you know, Grinzebach and how does it impact our customers as yeah. well, right? You know, Correct. The, the trade wars obviously mm-hmm. is uh, mm-hmm. very, you know, um, <laughs> we watch that every day, you know, <laughs> how to, what impact that's going to have on the, uh, on the, 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 uh, the stock market, not so much the stock market, but also the, the currency, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. sure. Right. How does that impact uh, the euro versus the dollar? That's very mm-hmm. much important for mm-hmm. me, right? You know, and how we, you know, because we have manufacturing in Germany and Europe, we have manufacturing uh, for my, our sister companies there and the understanding because, you know, at the, in this day, right, you know, for Grenzebach, right, there is not one project that we sell that is manufactured in one location. Mm. Right? Oh, okay. Right? Each location plays a part to manufacture to support our customer base, right? And so 
the changing dynamics of bringing equipment in from China or from Germany mm-hmm. and how that impacts our U.S. customers is very important. Mm-hmm. Right. So right. We need to have an understanding about and that. And the, the yeah. coronavirus, I mean, I've talked to several of our GMA members that are international, you yes. know, in scope. And mm-hmm. I mean, we got a lot of folks that are just, you know, Georgia-based. Yes. You know, and a lot that are just in the U.S. But uh, more and more, we're, we're, we're servicing and working with international companies. Yes. And, and um, I've been surprised by the feedback that I've gotten from some of our, our manufacturers that are international. And, mm-hmm. you know, with the coronavirus, they're they're like, you know, yeah. I, don't know how, I don't know how it's no, impacted I mean, you guys. It, it, it has very much yeah. impacted us. And, yeah. you know, we have, uh, you, know, um, you know, like I said before, we have quite a bit of equipment that's manufactured in China. Right? Sure. And our Chinese facility is only working at the uh, 15%, you know, capacity right at this right. point in time. That's having a big impact sure. on, our, uh, on our global customers, right? So we just – Understanding that and um, and understand what the impact of that is and uh, yes. is very important. Mm-hmm. So not to be negative Nancy yep. in the group yep. uh, or negative Ned, what 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 have you. <laughs> yep. um, but unfortunately, based on my take, right, of, of reading the tea leaves, um, while we all hope and pray that the virus itself has been contained because there's mm-hmm. been a, t- a ton of uh, mm-hmm. deaths and and other um, situations, obviously. However. The ripple effect throughout the global manufacturing, the global supply chain community, especially automotive and Mm high-tech, is yet to be seen, Uh, including, as we were talking about pre-show, the shipping industry. Yes. The ocean shipping industry has already taken a hit with the trade wars. Um, There was was an article in the Wall Street Journal this past week. Um, This will be a couple weeks old by the time this publishes, but five ocean shipping firms are already preparing profit warnings, mm, mm-hmm. and uh, over 50 sailings have been canceled since late January. Some ships are leaving the dock 10% full, so that ship's already yeah. at a loss. Even right. if they st- if it stops in the U.S. prior to hitting Europe, it's still mm-hmm. you know it'll be lucky to be 35% full. Um, and so this 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 ripple effect, this bullwhip effect, is still an yeah. apex term. Um, I don't want to be negative, but I think yeah. we'll uh, a month or two down the road we'll kind of see what the true impact's going to be. Yeah, yes. the lessons we all learn in the process. Yes. That's right. Yes. That's Correct. right. So Correct. we'll see. Uh, but I want to yep. circle back to something you, you, you spoke to on a much lighter note. Okay. Uh, because global organizations like uh, Grenzebach have to really, to, in order to execute, they have to really, um, all these teams in different places that, that are in different cultures mm-hmm. and they're geared differently, they've got to get past all of that yes. mm-hmm. to make it happen. Yes. So how does that, give us a couple of observations on just how great firms like yours are able to um, to bake that into the culture. Yes, I, you know that's that's a fantastic. You know, I always you know laugh at my uh, German colleagues, right? I have to mm-hmm. say when you come to the U.S., right? You know, and I have to tell my my customers in the U.S. when a, when our German colleagues tell you no, that's the German no, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> that really means that they're going to go back and think about it and come back with a solution, yes. but they just need some time, right? <laughs> yep. So, I, but that's 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 a funny story. So my, my German colleagues will laugh about that. Not that I'm saying all Germans are like that. But uh, but for me, it's really you know taking advantage, right? Understanding the differences uh, from the, the cultural that we have, and you know, we are an international company, and uh, my I'm proud to be responsible for our North American market, but, you know, in our executive leadership team, right, so when I go over to Germany, I was in Germany, uh, you know, last week and meeting with our, with my counter, with my uh, counterparts over from Germany, mm-hmm. and unfortunately, our, our, our team, from my team from China couldn't make it because of the virus, yeah. but, you know, I think when we sit down together, we all have different perspectives, right? Mm-hmm. We have, uh, you know, an American perspective, we have a European perspective, mm-hmm. you know, we have now uh, companies from Belgium, you know, mm-hmm. and then um, we have, uh, you know, our, our global global CEO sure. uh, uh, is not from Germany, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, uh, but, you know, overall, um, I think just coming from those different perspectives, I think is fantastic, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it, it gives us a sense of that we are a global community. And each one of us has a very important voice. Mm. Um, you know, yeah. I, I represent North America, but that doesn't mean that I can't give my input on something that's going over in Germany, right? Or even mm. something that's going over in China or vice versa, mm-hmm. right? Mm. And I think those those being able to be open and work together and have that open communication is very important when yes. you work for a global organization. Yeah. And I would, I, would, I would venture to say that, that sharing best practices globally yes. – is even more beneficial. Yes, exactly. Right? I mean, because if they're finding things and figuring things out in a unique way in Europe that we're not using yet, yes, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a that's a that's a strategic advantage for Rizbach rather than 
very important. Right. I said that's a yeah. key point, right? Because mm-hmm. a lot of times it doesn't matter where the technology is coming from, right? Whether the solution mm-hmm. was invented in North America, but then utilized in Europe or mm-hmm. vice versa. I think it's uh, our global footprint because our customers also, you know, have see different things, right? right. From our customer base, oh, right? Yeah. 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 Which allows us to be creative and, and find different solutions that then may be able to solve a problem that our customers in North America are having, but they didn't really, maybe didn't really focus on it. Now we could bring to the table and say, hey, have you ever thought about this? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow, yeah, I, I am having that problem. That's a fantastic solution. Thank you. Right. Mm-hmm. So that, that collaboration, mm-hmm. we have multiple global meetings, and not just the executive level. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have global HR meetings, right? Really? Yes. Wow. We have uh, global cool. technology meetings, right? Mm-hmm. We have global operations meetings, right? Um, so from the top of the organization all the way down, uh, throughout the overall organization, we believe in having that global community come together to give mm. best practices and ideas. Love it. And nice. That's, that's really helped us as an organization grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So um, there's so much more I want to dive into. For the <laughs> sake of time, we're going to keep trucking. Yep. How can our audience learn more about Grinzebach the organization? So, you know, obviously the easiest spot is uh, is uh, Grinzebach, www.grinzebach.com. Mm-hmm. Um, you go to our website. You can learn all about the company, all about the different technologies, your main contact points when you want to buy something. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, we are, we also have a local um, uh, part. Uh, Jason Lammers is our, our local sales guy. Uh, so his, uh, I think you can – I don't have track his card in front of me, but yeah, you can yeah. definitely track him down to mm-hmm. learn more about what Grinzebach can do from the local standpoint too, right? Because we not only manufacture for our, our customers across the country, but we do a lot of we can do a lot of stuff with our manufacturing facility right down in Newton, Georgia mm. uh, yeah. for our local local Georgia mm. uh, Slapots uh, customers in the local area as well. So mm-hmm. Love that. Mm-hmm. Yep. And and for our listeners, uh, the Grinzebach will have the link in the show notes of the episode, but it's uh, – for the sake of folks that can't spell like myself, <laughs> uh, G R E N Z E B A C H dot com. Yes. Yep. Um, now I know y'all are very active in the community. Uh, we've yes. already gathered that you know, y'all are at the Georgia Manufacturing Summit mm-hmm. in 2019, and and hope to see you there in 2020. You also will be at Modex, which yes. is one of the largest supply chain trade shows in the Western Hemisphere. Yes. Um, you've got a team that, if I understood you correctly, that will be speaking at the Modex coming up. Yes, yes. We have uh, two gentlemen who will be doing some speaking presentations at the Modex. They're very much involved with the MHI Material Handling Institute, uh, mm-hmm. David Schwabel and Brian Kiger. Okay. So I encourage uh, you all to come out and listen to what these fine gentlemen have to say. <laughs> and uh, while they're giving their, exp- you know, giving their, exp- they're much more experts at the supply chain <laughs> than I am. <laughs> so I rely very much on their on their expertise. Uh, yeah. So they will be very much involved at the show. So I encourage awesome. everybody to come to Modex and listen to those guys speak. So cool. modexshow.com, uh, and, and it's free to attend. Uh, 35,000 of your uh, friends and neighbors from across the world of, of global supply chain. Okay, so uh, before we wrap up, Laura. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Uh, gosh, there's so much there. I know. <laughs> I kept wanting to jump in. And I was like, I don't want to cut John off. Yeah. And then Jason would come in with a great thing. And I said, well, I'm going to have to just hold my yeah. tongue for a moment. <laughs> well, um, so so what's one thing in, in your uh, from your purview, uh, uh-huh. when you think about global manufacturing, what's one thing that j- jumps off the the page and and it's really got your attention here lately well basically i think you touched on several points there john Uh, you know the digitalization actually so Mm -hmm. i'm going to do a couple things here real quick um uh, scott but uh also the working together because Mm -hmm. the biggest part of what i do is yes i have a lot of companies Mm -hmm. here in the u.s i work with but most of those companies are actually having parents overseas, Germany all the time, UK, Belgium, you know, you name it, Australia, Singapore. And, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate that I get the opportunity to do that because not only am I continuing to build that culture side of things, but I think, as you mentioned, key point, it's how do we continue to build off of each other's expertise? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about something like the digitalization platform, which I got that word out there, Scott, (laughs) I've had my coffee this morning. Um, Don't ask me to say what is it <laughs> Worcestershire or whatever it is. So, <laughs> but nevertheless there is a lot of education that's going on right now a lot of uh, not not even maybe as much you know from a flight perspective of let me get you there in person but there's a lot of information sharing through technology mm-hmm. you see some organizations using things like Google Glass mm-hmm. etc so they're disseminating that and they're doing a lot of discussion and changes dynamically right there on the floor for what is happening how do they incorporate this in somebody had a great idea over Mm -hmm. here 
It didn't fail, so mm. we're going to try it out over here. So I think those relationships and interconnectedness is really just – it's driving a lot of mm. the successes, especially as you mentioned, Scott. We're going to start seeing that tapering off. People got ahead of the Chinese New Year with orders, but, mm -hmm. you know, that only goes so far. So what are we going to do to continue to feed the supply chain, mm. feed our customers, and make sure that we're staying at the forefront of all of that? Mm. Yes. Mm. So they shouldn't feel hiccups. Yes. We should be the ones that feel the yeah, hiccups. Yes. But then my job is to make sure you don't Not, feel the yes, hiccups. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, you speak to something, uh, this notion of islands of excellence with, with global firms. You might have one plant that is just blown it out world class. Yep. But sometimes they don't always share that information. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. like within the four walls mentality. Correct. I'm not saying it, it's as prevalent as it used to be because I think just from my observations, mm -hmm. the industry um, is more transparent and more willing to share yeah. than even five, ten years ago from what I, I see. Mm -hmm. um, so companies certainly within their own footprint are getting better at, at sharing those best practices. And yes. clearly when you do things like you're doing at Grinzebach, uh, when you're, you're you're pulling the global HR team, the global operations team, you're facilitating the sharing so that these plants that do the, you know, these teams are great at ABC, and these plants that are great at, at DEF, they're mm -hmm. sharing and and that's where the learning. Absolutely. Place, you know? Well, and interestingly, too, because I saw Grenzebach, um, it continues to be recognized for its level of involvement in the community yes. and educating yes. nice. that next generation, yes. which uh, kudos to you guys. Yes. I mean, we've got to be full on front yes. and center on that. So, but the sharing of those people. So if they're trained over in Germany or in China, mm -hmm. sending them over for a year yes. over here to North America yes. and vice versa. I think those programs have really, the investment, the time mm -hmm. and energy has been reaping a lot of benefits and we're going to continue to see that uh, really start to gear itself up even more so into 2020. Yeah, yeah, love it. yeah the comment I didn't that's, I should, I'm remiss but not commenting on that right because yeah. <laughs> you know Grinsbuck was involved one of the one of the companies that really pushed was involved in the apprenticeship program mm -hmm. which is based on the German model right mm -hmm. so now high school students can start in 10th grade mm -hmm. you know making a choice right you know what they want to start their education along with the manufacturing firms love mm -hmm. it uh, we have uh, three uh, high school kids working for us great right now mm -hmm. but in conjunction Conjunction with our work with the CEC, in conjunction with our intern, with our intern, like our internship program where we mm -hmm. have our German mm -hmm. uh, uh, interns coming over and work for six months to a year, working yeah. in an organization. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, the next generation, we're very much involved. So I appreciate that comment. I, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that too because sure. uh, it wasn't in my show notes. I'm going to have to <laughs> hit up on all my. I just pull things like <laughs> that out of my back pocket. But you know, yeah, um, you guys were one of the founding. Yes. Mm -hmm organizations mm -hmm. in yes. the state of Georgia as they launched the German American apprenticeship program. Yes. And that's, a, that's been a huge yes. success. Yes. So I want, what I want to do here just th in this moment. So, so we're very, we love our global audience, right? Mm -hmm. We love the, the, the It's so neat to, to um, podcasting and the low barrier to entry. You can really get leadership thoughts out and perspective out and it get picked up wherever, right? Mm -hmm. Wherever folks are hungry for that. So what I'd like for you to do, John, is throw the gauntlet down and challenge manufacturers, whether they're here in the States or if they're in South America or if they're in China, wherever they are. But it's all about educating yes. and, and, and making aware of the next generation, right? Yeah. I, you know, I, you, we talked a little bit off, you know, Cameron, about my personal experience and where that's led me, right? Yeah. And, you know, the different exposure that you, we need to present to our children, right, to give them different options is so important. And manufacturing, and I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this, if you mm -hmm. can't touch with my voice. <laughs> you know, ma companies, and particularly manufacturing companies, have so much to give mm -hmm. and so much opportunities, and let's say, that we can give for the next generation if we would open it up. Uh, so I, I do challenge every company in the state of Georgia to work with your local communities and, mm -hmm. st and start a German-American chamber or uh, a apprenticeship program, sort of like what we've done here in, in, yeah. uh, in this area, which is really growing in the Atlanta area quite rapidly. So, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, if you want to have some discussions about that, about that, you know, look us up and we'll be happy. Like I've gone around and give, gave talks to mm. other companies and, stuff and, and um, talking to them about how we did it and how we're successful here. And, you know, I, I really challenge everybody to really open up your doors because you may not see, you know, it's not always about the short-term benefit, mm, right? We have yeah. to think about that next generation, right? Mm -hmm. We have to think about manufacturing and what it means in North America. And if we don't 
if we don't uh, present these options to our kids because if they're sitting around playing video games all day long like you know and not you know doing anything with their hands they will they will lose that interest mm. right yeah and well so put. then it's then it's harder to, it's harder to get I them when they're older i'll give you a real yeah. quick short story about involvement in manufacturing and learning about it i went to uh, henry county elementary school mcdonald elementary school <laughs> and in the first grade they took us to the uh the ford factory I was seven years old. They walked us around the Ford plant, and I was just fascinated. They're rolling in steel and rolling out cars, Mm. really smart people coming up with amazing solutions to tough problems to produce products, and I was just fascinated. And now, as an organization, what we do is we take industry professionals in to be able Mm -hmm. to do the same thing. Uh, If I win the lottery tomorrow... (laughs) <laughs> if I was to win the hey, lot, and I would have to freaking, I, 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 I promise you, I would definitely make the consideration. But, but you know, that's you know, being able to impact kids and get them to, if you can walk them to a factory, it can have a mm. amazing impact on at least, like you said, growing up as a child in that program, when you get a kid to walk through a factory, yes. it changes their perspective of the industry as a whole. If we as an industry don't make manufacturing sexy, yes. if we don't at least give them the chance. Now, the pushback that I get, the challenge that I have is you know, running the organization is it's, it's absolutely impossible to monetize it because kids don't have 20 bucks to – on a plant tour, and if it did, most factories uh, had John's, John's, John's does. does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact. But but the impact on the industry would be phenomenal down the road. But there's 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 challenges. One is insurance for yes. manufacturers to be yes. able to let kids in. Yes. The other is uh, the interest is there. Uh, there's some really cool stuff going out in Douglasville. They're doing some mm-hmm. stuff with yeah. high school seniors. But you have to be a senior to be able to be yes. part of the program. But if you take kids in first and second, third grade and let them see what manufacturing can be, mm-hmm. I promise you the results in 10 years will be amazing. And and we get to do that with industry professionals. You're talking five or 10 years ago, talking about the collective and the, mm-hmm. the engagement and, yeah. and, and openness mm-hmm. of factories. 10 years ago when I started trying to do plant tours, dude, it was almost <laughs> impossible. People yeah. would say, well, why do you want to come to yeah. a yes. you know, Who are you with and yeah. what do you want to come see? And it was horrible. But now that we've toured hundreds and hundreds of plants, mm-hmm. we've toured yeah. you know, Coca-Cola and Caterpillar and mm-hmm. Gulfstream and Daniel Defense and, 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 and Grinsbach, and we get to see world-class manufacturing, it's kind of brought that – that barrier down mm-hmm. a little bit. They trust us now. Yeah. They see that we're not coming in there to do any bad stuff, but it gives us the opportunity, yeah. again, to share best practices and to build that relationship. We can do it professionally, but if we could figure out a way to get the kids in there, man, that'd be golden. So uh, John's throwing the gauntlet down, and our <laughs> global audience will respond, no doubt. But yes. uh, you know, love what you are doing. Uh, and, Jason, really appreciate where you're coming from because, uh, of course, we're, we're talking about how kids can benefit. And, and how we got to tackle that awareness gap there. Mm-hmm. But professionals uh, uh, have, in many ways, the same type of lack of awareness, and, and you are tackling that. Mm-hmm. Um, but here, as we start to wrap up, yep. we want to get the GMA update because you all okay. got a big anniversary coming up. Yep. Right? Yep. Uh, but what's the biggest? I don't want to steal your thunder. What's, yeah, what's so, the, so Thursday, um, I know this is, might be going out a little late, but th- uh, February the 20th, we're doing our 12-year anniversary. We're really excited about that. We're doing it at the Gwinnett uh, Technical College. Um, there we're you know, uh, they're opening up a brand new advanced manufacturing mm. program, and we're going to celebrate. It's got that your name? Bit. It didn't actually. They don't. They didn't name it after me, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I did get tagged this year to be in the alumni of the year for Gwinnett Tech, and That's I'm awesome. really yeah. I'm congratulations. That. And, um, so we're gonna we're gonna help promote that program and all the all the proceeds that come in from the event. Mm-hmm. We're starting a GMA scholarship for fantastic. advanced manufacturing. Oh, I'm, I'm like stoked about it's that. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so so that's what's coming up in February. Um, in September is our uh, Georgia Manufacturing Summit, September mm. the 15th, Cobb Galleria. We're expecting to have over 1,000 people in attendance. Uh, we've never had our keynotes out this far in advance. I'm really excited. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We have Cindy and Marty Daniel, the CEO and president of uh, Daniel Defense. They mm-hmm. manufacture firearms down in South Georgia, uh, world-class firearms. they got 300,000 square feet, amazing mm-hmm. facility. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so Cindy and Marty are going to share their story about where they came from, you know, working yeah. in a garage, you know, in a closet in a garage, <laughs> you know, to, 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 to build a, you know. To uh, employ hundreds of people. Yeah, 300 people, yeah. 300 wow. people down in South Georgia, and they're making some fine firearms. Mm-hmm. But um, so we got that, and then we also – uh, we've never had a keynote um, 
outside of the industry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I've, I've partnered up with a guy by the name, Lieutenant Colonel Waldo Waldman. Yeah. Uh, great guy, phenomenal speaker. Wingman. He's a, yeah, he's a wingman. Yes. Man, That's exactly yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> um, he's a co- Hall of Fame keynote speaker. Um, he's executive leadership coach. I mean, he's coached, you know, a lot of the folks in the Fortune 100 CEOs. Um, I've engaged him, believe it or not, as a coaching relationship. And he is he is uh, making some significant impacts in the direction of GMA. Um and again, New York Times bestseller, great guy. Uh, so we'll, he'll be, he'll be our lunchtime keynote. We'll, we'll have educational sessions throughout the day. September fifteenth. September fifteenth. Talking about Georgia Manufacturing yeah. Summit, right? And the Georgia Manufacturing Awards. So we are taking nominations. That's open up. You can go to GeorgiaManufacturingAwards.com. dot com. There's no mm-hmm. no charge or anything. Just go in and put in your people. We've got four different categories. Uh, and again, it's to highlight and showcase the good people that are doing good work. It's not about the company. Mm-hmm. It's not about the product. It's about the people of manufacturing. Yes, so we're stoked it. about that. Yeah. Gosh, no shortage of things no. that the, the GMA <laughs> does to support the industry. I love that. Yeah, we've that. got about probably 15 other events on the schedule. We, last year we did about we had about 3,500 people mm-hmm. attend events that we hosted, and we hosted 120 mm. events around the state. Mm. So we're pretty pretty active. Yeah. So if you want to go check out some cool manufacturing, go check it out at Georgia Manufacturing alliance.com okay so yeah. good you're, you're you're reading my mind uh which my <laughs> wife says is not tough to do so maybe our wives are related i don't know <laughs> right right um, and while you're at george manufacturing alliance.com you can look up grinsbach yes, and yes. see jason's information because yes. jason lammer's information is listed at george manufacturing alliance.com Fantastic. okay so george manufacturing alliance.com to, to learn mm-hmm. more about all things gma correct right and Laura, tell us about how folks can get in touch with you. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, I'm definitely heavy on LinkedIn, so please reach out to me. I'm always happy to connect and talk and see what I can share for value adds and make connections for you. Um, uh, outside of LinkedIn, uh, my firm is at HLB Gross Collins, so it's HLB G R O S S C O L L ins.com that's our website you'll find me on there underneath the mdns segment um as well as through other social media sites twitter uh facebook i'm sure there's others that i'm just They're not everywhere even. i'm <laughs> old school now so <laughs> i hate to admit it but yeah yep. yeah and then also you will also find me under the joint man- manufacturing alliance.com because mm. i am very fortunate to be the cob metro atlanta chapter director for gma so out of those 3500 events at least 12 of those are <laughs> Over at my office uh, monthly, we bring in um, manufacturers, uh, industry leaders, and experts to share insights and make great connections for people in the community. Fantastic. Love it. Love it. Uh, and, of course, all of these URLs that we're mentioning will be on, as part of the show notes and make it really easy for folks to, to learn more and connect after the show. Okay. As much as I want to just add on one more hour, I know I know we have a global business responsibility around this table, so we can't do that. But to our audience, uh, be sure to check out our events and webinar tabs at SupplyChainNowRadio.com for some of our upcoming in-person and virtual events that are coming up uh, with partners around the world. Not only will we, we be broadcasting live at Modex, so we'll probably rub rubbing elbows with uh, Grenzebach and, and others, uh, uh, but also we just announced this past week we're going to be at Supply Chain USA 2020 up in Chicago Ooh, with the nice. great folks at EFT and Reuters event. So looking forward to that. And I think, I'm not sure if they're going to let Greg out on the floor, Greg mm-hmm. White, who's mm-hmm. my uh, partner in crime. Mm-hmm. But I believe we're going to be interviewing a lot of, the, a lot of their keynotes right there kind of after their keynote. Folks are going to get a sense of who they are as people and leaders and whatnot. So really looking forward to that. Okay. Uh, big thanks to our guests here today, uh, John Fluker, President CEO at Grinzebach. You can learn more at grinzebach.com. Yes, and, and also LinkedIn. LinkedIn, too. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, sir. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, to our social media entrepreneurs out there, please, no more social. We've we got 17,000 different social media. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're good, at least for a couple weeks. Right, Laura? That's <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> but big thanks. I love, uh, John, really appreciate where you come from, uh, from your leadership yeah, perspective fantastic. and what you are doing to, to reinvest into the community and the industry. What a great story, and thanks for also throwing the gauntlet down and challenging other organizations to do the same. Uh, hopefully, our, I'm sure our audience enjoyed it as much as, uh, as I did. Uh, Jason Moss, CEO of the Georgia Manufacturing Alliance, great to have you back. Glad to be back, man. Uh, and Laura Mat- it really, Yeah, it really it's was. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Laura Matajewski, appreciate your uh, firm's sponsorship of these conversations, mm-hmm. and great to have you in uh, back in studio as well. Um, to our audience, be sure to check out other upcoming events, replays of our interviews, other resources at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. And, again, you can find us wherever you get your podcasts from, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. 
wherever you get your podcasts from. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Behalf On behalf of the entire team here, Scott Luton wishes you a wonderful week ahead, and we'll see you next time on Spot Channel. Thanks, everybody.